Mark, tell us first what, um, what Climate uh, Depot is. What, what do you do? It's a daily news and information site. It's sort of your daily global warming newspaper. Uh, it takes a skeptical view editorially, but they try to cover all sides of the debate. If Al Gore says something, if the United Nations says something, if Michael Mann says something, we try to cover that, and it's all on there. You're one-stop shopping for global warming news and information. Okay, well, that's, that's a good advert for it. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of, um, there's, there's obviously a sort of lots of different debates um, going on all around the world, and uh, I guess the, the sort of debate about climate silence is highly technical and highly highly polarised. What what in particular is it that you, um, you 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 disagree with? If you can just focus, I guess, because many of the people watching won't be sort of experts. What what in particular is it about um, the science that, that sure. you don't? that you disagree with? Well, I think what happened was in 1988, when the UN IPCC was formed, the first report came out in 1990, the science... And that's, that, sorry, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on yes. Climate Change, so people, and, that's, yes. and that is a, what, that's a UN body set up to analyze the climate science. Set up to analyze the climate science. They essentially were set up to analyze CO2's impact on global warming. So it became a self-serving organization which politicized the science. In other words, if you, especially if you go back and look at the climate gate emails that had the upper echelon of the United Nations scientists openly talking about what studies they would include and what they would exclude, it turns out they excluded studies that dealt with the sun. We had one UN scientist saying he went to a solar conference and he was dismayed at all the scientists who, didn't, who believed the sun was a major impact. Um, but what we're finding is these reports are political. And the most recent report that came out, uh, the, the report that came out in September, was essentially written by a handful of United Nations scientists, and it, they're fulfilling a political narrative on global warming, as the real world fails to support that narrative. And as the United States Senate, where I worked, we had a report initially of 400 dissenting scientists from the UN, which we updated to 650, then 700, and then we retired after we hit 1,000. And it includes Nobel Prize winners. It included people like Norman Borlaug, who had the agricultural revolution. It included Freeman Dyson. It included people who now are reversing themselves. People like James Lovelock, who's now gone from an alarmist to almost skeptic, to Leonard Bengston, the Swedish scientist, who's a UN IPCC, now says we wouldn't even have noticed the global warming. Uh, and it's, okay, it's an amazing thing to watch yeah, because sure. the UN is a, first and foremost a political process, not scientific. Sure. Yeah. But, but um, if, if, if we met many of our, our, the viewers might not understand who any of those people are, but I suppose if they can, they're, they're all well known, so they can, sure. they can, they can Wikipedia them. In terms, of the, um, in, ter in terms of the actual sort of basics of the science, I'm not a science um, climate right. scientist. Um, I'm a journalist who sort of covers this um, from time to time. But in terms of the, the basics, I mean, do you agree that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have the basic greenhouse gas eff effect? Yes, is, I, is, that, is that something that you, yes, would, you would basically agree Yes, CO2 can be a on? warming agent. However, yeah. there are quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. Everything from tilt to the Earth's axis to water vapor, methane, the solar system, ocean cycles, sure. the sun, volcanic dust. To sit there and say, as the United Nations mandate essentially is to do, that CO2 is the tail that wags the dog is no longer scientifically tenable. That's why we had all this, uh, this uh, nail biting, if you will, over the global warming standstill or pause. First, they came out and said it was Chinese coal use, which was you know, essentially causing dimming and cooling the earth, and that prevented it. Then they came out and said that the ban on CFCs from the Montreal Protocol uh, were the reason for it. And now they've come out and said, what pause? It doesn't exist. We've readjusted the temperatures, and we've recalibrated Arctic temperatures to say that global warming pause didn't exist. The settled science, which the United Nations claim, seems to be changing by the week. We had two contrary studies, one saying the pause was due to the Montreal Protocol, the other saying the pause never actually existed because we've yeah. redone the numbers. This okay. is an embarrassment, and it continues on a daily basis. Well, a, a major part of, of these talks, I guess, is focused on um, adaptation, and we can see um, from NASA footage that the Arctic is melting, that there are parts of the Arctic, particularly in the summer, um, which is melting, and there are other parts of the ice caps um, which are also melting, which are causing ri ri rising which, sea levels. Would, do you, do, would you accept that it's important um, to discuss how countries can work out how they can cope 
well, with adaption, changing, changing yes. weather systems. Well, first of all, adaption is fine. You always should adapt to climate change, uh, natural climate change. You should always adapt to. But you just said the Arctic. Arctic ice cap melting is not going to raise sea level because the Arctic's floating. A absolutely. Southern Hemisphere, the Antarctic, is at, at record, expanded to record sea ice. And the Arctic monitoring began in the late 1970s mm -hmm. uh, when the end of the global cooling uh, scare, which was the high point probably of Arctic ice, and that's when satellite monitoring began. So yeah, we've lost a little ice in the Arctic in the summer, but global sea ice uh, actually hasn't had that much of a trend. And this year, we're actually above average, well above average for global sea ice if you combine both poles. OK. What, um, what would it take you to be convinced? What, what, what do you need to Good see? Good question. What I think we need to see is, first of all, unprecedented climate and weather, and we have neither. Multiple studies, in fact, hundreds of scientists doing different studies have shown the medieval and Roman warming periods were as warm or warmer than current temperatures. We have a man from the Philippines here who I consider to be exploiting a tragedy, Yeb Sano, this horrible tragedy that's befallen the Philippines. He's out there this whole week doing a hunger strike, implying that a UN treaty of some kind could prevent natural weather disasters like typhoons. That that is akin to medieval witchcraft at this point, to think that the United Nations can prevent future typhoons. It's one thing to talk about adaption, it's another to imply that the United Nations can control the weather, and unfortunately that's where this conference okay. is headed. All right. well, there's, there's, no need, there's no need to shout, and I think that he, he, had, his, he had his brother there who was in... I understand the tragedy in, of it, in, it's so horrible. I, I think it's important to have a, an element of sympathy for for the Philippines. What, well, what, what, you can have what? an element of sympathy, but when it turns to exploitation of sure, science sure. and well, they, telling people yeah, that man absolutely. caused this tragedy, they, when uh, there's been, uh, I think there's only ranks as the seventh worst uh, typhoon to hit the Philippines. It was very bad, but to turn this into proof of global warming is unscientific and sheer cheap exploitation. Sure. I think, I think many, many, we need to be, we need to be clear here. Many, many would, many would, and many do strongly disagree with you. Uh, what, what if you are wrong? What what great if question. you are wrong? Because if you are wrong, and if you've been saying that we should carry on business as usual, and what the scientists say, what these wealth of scientists from around the world, who I have no reason to doubt their integrity. You may be very keen well, that there you is a You obviously haven't looked into it if conspiracy. you don't doubt their integrity. Well, I, I, I've, <laughs> I've looked at, I've read these summaries of the IPCC right. report, and it, you know, if it is a global conspiracy, well, it, it, it's very it's well done. It's great political what theater. If, yes. What if you're wrong? What if I'm wrong? Let's reverse it for one second. What if you're no, no, right? No, no. Answer the question. What if you're if wrong? If I'm wrong, people say, why not get an insurance policy if you're wrong? Here's a simple answer. Why would you buy an insurance policy on your home that costs more than your home's worth and would pay out virtually nothing if your home burned down? You wouldn't. That would be insurance fraud. And that's what they're selling. The Kyoto Protocol, even if fully implemented and ratified, which it never was, wouldn't have even had a noticeable, detectable impact on global temperatures within 50 to 100 years. In the United States, cap and trade, carbon taxes, not only would they not impact global CO2 level, they wouldn't even impact global temperature. So the idea that somehow we can do an insurance policy with anything the United Nations is currently discussing is pure madness. It's silliness to think that treaties and acts of Congress or the EU can control the weather in any way that would be noticeable. Uh, and you know, it, it may, may as well claim that had the Kyoto Protocol been fully implemented and, and achieved, we could have prevented this typhoon. The weather doesn't work that way. And I think the idea that we need an insurance policy makes absolutely no sense when you guys, the question is, if you're right, we basically have to accept a climate catastrophe because there's no solution, according to you guys, other than just restricting economies and emissions. And then you get into the immorality of telling Africans and 1.6 billion people of color in the developing world, Asia, Africa, South America, that they can't develop with coal and natural gas and carbon-based energy like we have. You get into a, 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 a basically a racial component where the white, wealthy Western world is telling the developing world they can't have the same standard of living. And we've had people like Governor of California, Jerry Brown, say that very thing, that the developing world can't emulate wealthy Western prosperity because the earth can't handle it. In other words, they can't have modern sewage and coal plants as the Obama administration prevents coal through the World Bank, but you can get a solar panel on your hut made of dung. We'll let you do that. It's immoral. So this whole agenda here is politics. We have Michael Oppenheimer, okay. who's okay. doing this UN right. report, okay. was on the payroll of Barbara Streisand of Hollywood. Big Hollywood is funding yeah. one of your top UN scientists. I don't hear you sure. worried about his credibility there. Sure. Well, he's not one of my scientists because... Um, well, he's one I, of the UN scientists. I don't work for the UN. But okay. um, no, I think you made your, your points very clear. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Appreciate it.